Hello everyone, how are you doing? This is a video for week eight for Algebra 1B. I'm going over quadratic graphs. So for week eight, make sure you're going through everything. I have our textbook, which is a very helpful resource for you. Make sure you're taking notes and uh, let me know if you have any questions on the assignments. Here's what we get learning for week eight. If I give you a quadratic equation in standard form, we're gonna recognize how the coefficients affect the way the parabola looks like on the graph. If I give you a quadratic equation in intercept form, which is also called factored form, we're talking about how to find the x-intercepts and the vertex of the parabola. And then if I give you a quadratic equation, can we use graphs to help represent equations and find solutions? We're going to be dealing with the quadratic equation and using square roots to solve it, and a little bit with word problems, representing word problems with an equation and a graph to solve things out. So lots of stuff with quadratic equations. The last few weeks, we've been working a lot with polynomials. So going over a lot of things like terms and coefficients and vocabulary. We learned how to add, subtract, and multiply, and factor these polynomials out. All of these skills that we've learned will enable us to learn a whole new class of function now. And that is the quadratic function. <clears throat> We've already done some stuff with linear functions. That was what Algebra A was largely focused on, was graphs, lines, slopes, setting up linear equations, solving linear equations, which is all great and good. And actually, linear equations are a polynomial, right? We have two terms, one, two. There's my coefficient m. But what we're gonna ramp up to now is working with quadratic equations. A quadratic equation or function simply means we have an x squared as a variable somewhere in our equation. No, nothing higher than x squared, but we have to have an x squared in there. Notice a lot of it actually looks really similar to linear. Instead of mx plus b, there's a bx plus c. And then we have our whole quadratic term with the x squared. So let's take a look at quadratic functions. Over the next few weeks, we're gonna be looking at what do the graphs look like? Patterns in table of values, what are quadratic patterns like? We're gonna solve all sorts of quadratic equations. There's some new things we need to learn. And ultimately using them to represent situations, a lot of times involve area, uh, curves, projectile motion. All right, let's talk about the parabola. It's a fancy math word. It's not parabola, it's not ebola, it's parabola. And that's what we call the graph of a quadratic equation. It's a parabola. So some characteristics of a parabola. It's symmetrical, which means there's a line of symmetry that cuts the parabola in half. It kind of can spin it around. If I go to the right, and go to the left, it's the same distance away from the line of symmetry. There are x-intercepts, so we still are interested in x-intercepts. A lot of times now, there may be two x-intercepts. It depends on where my parabola crosses. Lines, linear functions, only had one x-intercept to worry about. With parabolas, we have to be aware of if there's two, or if there's one, or sometimes there's not any x-intercepts. Parabolas, have a vertex that's either the very minimum point like this one is so it starts up high it decreases 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 touches at the vertex and then it starts to increase again so this would be a minimum point for the vertex other parabolas open down and have a maximum point for the vertex and then every parabola does have a y-intercept where it crosses the y-axis so there you go that's a little bit about what we're going to be working with Finding a lot of what we do is find x-intercepts, find the vertex, think about how symmetrical it is, look for y-intercepts. Being able to find all these points on a graph and then use algebra to find these points, that's a lot of what we're going to do over this week and next week. Let's play around a little bit more with standard form using our Desmos calculator and understand how changing the parameters of our function actually affect the way the graph looks. So we're going to open up our Desmos calculator and, and do some stuff here. Okay, here I am. We have our Desmos calculator open. I put in a function in standard form. There's my ax squared, my quadratic term. There's bx and there's c. And I put a slider in for a, b, and c, and right now they're all set to one. I'm gonna move the c to zero for right now. 
and move B to zero. And this is the most basic quadratic function. You can see this one opens up. It's got centered right at zero, zero. That's where the vertex is. And the equation for this one would simply be y equals x squared. Really basic parabola. I'll even put that in here. y equals x squared. So that's the most basic parabola. And what we're going to do is adjust a, b, and c in my coefficients here and see how does that change from my most basic parent function y equals x squared. So let's start with a. If I make a 2, what is that changing? Well, it looks like it narrowed in a little bit, right? If I make a 3, it narrows in a little bit more. And you can think of a as kind of like the slope. It's telling me how fast is it going to increase. This one increases a little bit. But if I make a bigger, I'm multiplying by bigger number, it's going to get bigger a lot faster in both directions. So making a bigger narrows the parabola because it's growing faster. What if I make a smaller than 1? Well, now it's getting wider because it's growing at a fraction, right? If I have it at 0.2, it's multiplying x squared by 0.2. That's a smaller amount. Now let's do 1. And 0 is a flat line. And if I get negative, now we get really interesting because now negative means it's going in a negative direction. It's taking the x squared values and making them the opposite. So it's going to decrease. So a opens up your parabola, makes it narrower or wider. If a is negative, your parabola is going to be decreasing and the vertex is a maximum point. If a is positive, your parabola is opening up and the vertex is a minimum point. Okay, so interesting with A. Let's look at what B does. B is kind of interesting because it sort of just moves it around, right? It seems like it shifts it to the left and down, shifts it to the right and then down. And B, again, as we factored, it plays around with some things. Just notice that B can affect it. There's not really too much we're going to talk about with B yet. Let's just make B1 for right now. Oh, there we go. Finally, we got C. C just simply moves it up or down, right? C is our vertical shift. If I have plus 3 or plus 2 right here, let's make B 0. And there we go. There's plus 2. If I make C 5, it's going to cross a 5. Now what's interesting is... If C is at 5, even if I adjust B around, what is the y-intercept? So B is at 5.4, right? Some random number. C is still 5. My y-intercept is still at 5. If I change B over here to negative 8, negative 9, my y-intercept is still 5. So this value of C right here is always going to be your y-intercept or where it crosses the y-axis. So there you go. There's a little bit about playing around with this. You can open up your Desmos calculator as well. You should be using graphs. You should be checking your work and doing a lot of this as you do quadratic functions. And you can come in here and put anything you want. 3x squared minus 5x minus 2. And there's our quadratic function. We can check the vertex by clicking on it. We can find the x and y, inter x and y intercepts by clicking on them. We can see what it does. We can even turn it into a table of values and get some points this way. Use the Desmos calculator as not the only tool, but as a good way to check, visualize, and see your work throughout this week and next week as we work with quadratic equations. All right, let's go back into our PowerPoint and continue looking at uh, more with quadratic equations. All right, let's summarize what we got. If we have a quadratic equation in standard form, this is a standard form, ax squared plus bx plus c, if a is positive, the parabola opens up like a u. If a is a negative number, the parabola opens down like an n. The coefficient a tells you how narrow or wide the parabola opens, and the constant c is our y-intercept. These are the big ideas you want to get as you're doing graphs of quadratic equations. 
Okay, now everyone, we can graph the following parabola, and let's see what the coordinates of the x-intercepts and the vertex are. So we got x squared plus 4x minus 12. So I'm going to switch back and let's graph this and just jot down some things here. Okay, here we are. I've got the equation graphed, y equals x squared plus 4x minus 12. And what do we see? I have one x-intercept at negative 6. I've got another x-intercept at 2, <clears throat> and the vertex is at negative 2, 16. I'm going to jot that down really quick, and let's go back now to our PowerPoint and explore some of this stuff. So this one had two x-intercepts, right? So we had one x-intercept at negative 6. That x value made y turn to 0. The other one was at positive 2, y turns to 0. And the vertex was at negative 2, when x is negative 2, we had a y value of negative 16. Now let's play around with some stuff here, looking a little bit more closely at this uh, function. When I look just at this part here, this is a trinomial, and if I think about it a little bit, this actually factors nicely. <clears throat> what are two numbers that add to 4 but multiply to negative 2? Well, it's going to be x plus 6 times x minus 2. So we can rewrite this equation instead of standard form. We now have what we call factored form. Why is factored form helpful? Well, we can really easily see the x-intercepts. What happens if I make x negative 6 in this? Well, negative 6 plus 6 turns into 0. And the whole thing becomes 0, and that's our x-intercept. <clears throat> what happens if I put in positive 2? 2 minus 2 is 0. It multiplies to 0, and that's the other x-intercept. <clears throat> what do I notice about negative 6 and 2? Remember, our parabola is symmetrical. So if I do a number line, here's negative 6, negative 5, negative 4, negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, and then 1 and 2. Guess where the vertex is at negative 2? That is going to be 4 in from this way and 4 in from this way. And so we have our line of symmetry right there at negative 2. Your vertex is always going to be exactly in between your two x-intercepts. That's kind of the point I'm trying to make here. So this is some, some ideas to consider now. We've got factored form. <clears throat> Putting a quadratic form function in intercept or factored form looks like this. If we can do that, because we can, if we're good at factoring, if we're able to factor it, the x-intercepts then are really easy to find out. Whoops. They occur at whatever m is and whatever n is to make it go to 0. And the x value of the vertex occurs exactly in between m and n on the graph because the whole thing is symmetrical. So without even graphing, let's take a look at this quadratic equation. I'm going to see if I can factor it. And then I'm going to see if I can find the x-intercepts and vertex. Okay, so to factored form, this is a trinomial, leading coefficient of 1. I need two numbers that multiply to negative 35 but add to 2. Well, it's going to be plus 7 and minus 5. 7 times negative 5 is negative 35, but 7 plus negative 5 gives me 2. So there's my factored form. This is the same exact parabola, the same exact equation, just in a different form. So there's one x-intercept. If I put negative 7, negative 7 is going to be an x-intercept now. That's an x-intercept. And the other one is if x is positive 5. That's going to make it go to 0. So there's my other x-intercept. To find the vertex now, I need to find a number exactly in between negative 7 and 5. Those are 12 apart, so I need to add 6 either way, so that the vertex is at negative 1. 
And now if I want to find the y value of the vertex, I'm going to put negative 1 in for x. And that way I can find y. So let's do negative 1 squared plus 2 times negative 1 minus 35. If I simplify that, I get 1 plus negative 2 minus 35. That's negative 37, negative 36. So the vertex is at a y value of negative 36. So there we go. If I do a quick sketch of this thing, really fast sketch, we're going to have one x-intercept at negative 7. We'll have another x-intercept at positive 5. At negative 1, there's my line of symmetry. So I'm going to go ahead and draw a little line here. And the vertex is way down here at negative 36. I'm just going to put a point there and say, all right, negative 1, negative 36. So this is a parabola that will open up. And now I have a really good idea. It's not a very good graph at all, but I can use my Desmos calculator to get a better graph. But the point is, I didn't even have to graph it. I was able to algebraically find both x-intercepts and algebraically find the vertex all about just simply by being able to put it into factored form. That's why factored form or intercept form is really helpful. And there we go. Now we're using our factoring to help get us somewhere and understand quadratic equations. Okay, let's get into solving and finding solutions. How would I solve this equation? We got 4x squared plus 11x minus 3 equals 10. Well, this is going to be a little tricky, right? Normally when I solve equations, my goal is to figure out how to get x by itself. But I have an x squared and then I have an x. How do I combine these? These are not like terms. So we need to use some strategies to start thinking about how we find solutions to quadratic equations. There's some things we need to do beyond just how we did with linear equations. So let's first of all, Let's understand graphically how we can do this. So I'm going to use my Desmos calculator. We're going to write this down, and we're going to estimate a solution from the graph and use our graphs to help understand how to solve solutions. All right, I've got it written down. Let's open up our Desmos calculator. All right, here I am. Now you'll notice I split this thing up, right? We had 4x squared plus 11x minus 3 but the original equation was all this was equal to 10. But what I did is I separated the left half and the right half as two separate equations. And the solutions are going to be where they intersect. When does all this equal 10? Well, this graph is going to equal 10 at this point, at this x value of 0.892. And it's going to equal 10 at this value of negative 3.642. We got two solutions. So jot those down here. So negative 3.642 and positive 0 0.892. You can use this as you're practicing solving equations, working with quadratic equations. We can come in and find solutions and estimate solutions from the graph. That's a good place to get started. It's not the only place because we're going to learn how to algebraically find exact solutions. These are just rounded solutions, right? This is not the exact answers, but at least it helps me know I can check my algebra, come in and graph it, and make sure when I'm doing my algebra and getting the exact solution, it actually matches up with what I get graphically. Okay, so what did we see? We saw that if, let me get my pen up, the solutions are going to be that x equals negative 3.642. I put that in for x, that's going to make it equal to 10, or 0 0.892. There's two solutions, right? Both of these, if I put them in for x, are going to make it equal to 10. But they're not exact, so they are rounded. So if I check my work, if I actually use a calculator, they're probably not going to equal exactly 10, but at least it's a, a pretty close approximation. Okay, let's look at another way to solve and find solutions of quadratic equations. 
we've already used factoring and the zero product property, right? In fact, we did that just a little bit ago with x-intercepts. A third way is to use square roots. Let me show you a quick example here. What is a number that if I square it equals 9? Well, one solution is 3 because 3 squared equals 9. But there's another solution too that may not jump out at you. But if I take negative 3 and square it, negative 3 times negative 3 also equals 9. There's two different solutions. If I want to write it up algebraically, remember how in algebra we like to do things but then to solve and we like to undo things to get x by itself if we have x squared and my goal is to isolate x and find out what x equals I can take the square root of both sides square root is the opposite of squaring so I can say okay let's square root the left side and square root the right side if I take x, square it, and take the square root of it, all I now have left now is x. I've isolated x. I've done the same thing on both sides. So x equals the square root of 9, which we have a symbol for. Whenever we take the square root, we have to account for both the positive and the negative solutions. We take a little plus and minus the square root of 9, which is 3. This little plus minus symbol means that x equals 3 or x could equal negative 3. Whenever you take the square root of both sides, you have to account for both solutions, positive and negative, because you have to put in this little plus minus symbol. You're going to see that a lot this week and next week, because oftentimes there are two solutions to find when we solve quadratics. Right, let's solve this equation. 2x squared minus 20 equals 52. What does x have to be to make this equation true? Well, let's draw my little line down. Let's use some algebra to solve it out. My goal is to isolate x, right? Solve for x. I want to know what is x equal. Well, let's do some things to get there. Let's add 20 to both sides. I want to get rid of that. It's the opposite of minus 20. That goes to 0. So now I've got 2 times x squared equals 72. Now I've got to get rid of this 2. 2 times x squared, I don't want that. I just want x squared. I want to isolate x squared. So I'm going to divide both sides by 2. That divides into 1. So now I've got x squared equals 36. And now it's at this point where I want to take the square root of both sides. Notice I didn't take the square root of both sides up here. You have to get your squared term isolated first. So then we're just square rooting. So get x squared all by itself first and then square root both sides. Now we've got x by itself. That's the opposite of squaring equals plus or minus the square root of 36 is 6 because 6 times 6 is 36. So there's my two solutions. If x equals 6, x equals negative 6, that's going to make it work out. We can check it over here. Let's do negative 6 and see. Is 2 times negative 6 squared minus 20, does that actually equal 52? Negative 6 squared is 36. 2 times 36 is 72, and 72 minus 20 is 52. So yep, it checks out. I'm feeling really good about our algebra so far. So taking the square root of both sides is a great method. Let's solve this one. Well, this one's a little bit interesting, right? I've got a trinomial, but I want to show you a good strategy. Remember when we recognized special cases? This is a special case of something squared x squared and 5 squared and with the 10x in the middle you can check on your own but this actually factors into x plus 5 times x plus 5 and you may say well how is that helpful except I can rewrite this as x plus 5 squared right it's one of our special cases of a binomial squared Here's my equation now. I've turned it into this. This is now very easy to solve using the square roots. I have something squared, right? All of this x plus 5 is being squared. I don't want the squared anymore, so let's square root all the left side and square root the right side. 
square root undoes the squaring, so now I've just got x plus 5 all by itself, equal to 2, but be careful, it's plus 2 or minus 2, both of those square into 4. Finally, I'm going to subtract 5 from both sides because I want x by itself, so x equals plus or minus 2, subtract 5. Now there's two solutions there, so let's be careful with that. One solution is x equals negative 2 minus 5, which is going to be negative 7. The other solution is x equals positive 2 minus 5, which means x could be negative 3. Now let's check this out using our graph, negative 7 and uh, negative 3. Let's make sure those are our solutions, and we'll just, again, check graphically that we did this right. So I'm going to graph this. The left side, the right side is two separate equations. So let's see what we got here. Okay, here I am. I've got y equals x squared plus 10x plus 25. The other side is y equals 4. I want to know when are these equal, so when are they going to intersect? Well, look at that. At an x value of negative 7 is one solution. And an x value of negative 3 is another solution. So graphically, we just confirmed that our algebra is right on. So I feel really good about that problem. Okay, let's do a word problem. Uh, a great application for quadratic equations and all these squared terms and variables is motion, projectile motion. Things going up in the air, things falling back down. Uh, if you take any sort of a physics class, you're probably going to encounter some of these equations in here. But here we go. Let's take a look at this problem. Victor throws an apple out of a window on the 10th floor, which is 120 feet above the ground. One second later, Juan throws an orange out of a 6th floor window, which is 72 feet above the ground. Which fruit reaches the ground first, and how much faster does it get there? All right, this is a good problem. In projectile motion, or in free fall motion, we have this equation right here, which I want to help make sense of all this for you guys. So we got some g's, we got some t's, we've got some y sub zeros, we got have half, all that good stuff. What does this mean? Well, y represents the height. How high is our apple or piece of fruit at any point in time? t is time often time in seconds. So as seconds go by, the height is going to keep falling in this case, right? The more time goes by, the apple's falling, 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 eventually it's going to splat on the ground. G, if you haven't figured it out yet, G is your gravity coefficient. You can look in our textbook, but if you're dealing with feet per second, Gravity is going to be negative 32. That's how feet per second squared. That's the acceleration of gravity. Second, we're not a room there. Second squared. If you're dealing with meters, which you know oftentimes we do, meters and feet, different units. Dealing with meters, you're going to be dealing with um, negative 9.8. Feet per second. Sorry, meters per second squared. So let's clear that out, and let's take a look at this actual problem now. So Victor, let's start with just Victor first. He throws an apple out of a window on the 10th floor, which is 120 feet above ground. So when I interpret that, that's going to be his starting value, his y sub 0 just means starting height is going to be 120 feet. Now the fact that we use feet also tells me what gravitational constant I'm going to use. So g is going to equal negative 16. That's my coefficient for negative uh, 32. Sorry. That's my gravitational constant when I'm dealing with feet and measurements from feet. So, let's play around now with this equation. For Victor, we're going to have his height is equal to negative one-half times 
the gravitational constant, which is 32, times t squared, and he starts at 120 feet. This should be a positive. I put a negative in there, but I forgot there was already a negative. What this ends up turning into then is negative 16, that's 1 half times 32, times t squared plus 120. So there you can see he's starting off 120 feet in the air, but you got gravity pulling him down the opposite direction, and eventually it's going to land on the ground. Now one thing that trips students up is, well, how do I find y and t? I don't know either of those. You actually do know y in this case because we want to know when the fruit reaches the ground. Well, the ground has a height of 0. If it lands on the ground, it means it's not 120 feet in the air anymore. It's landed on the ground. So we need to solve this equation right here. We need to solve when does gravity pulling it down, how long does it take? We're going to solve for t if it starts at 120 feet in the air. Well, that's pretty easy to solve, right? Let's subtract 120 from both sides. So we've got negative 120 equals negative 16 times t squared. I'm going to now divide both sides by negative 16. And so we got t squared equals 120 divided by 16 is going to be 7.5. But I don't want t squared, I want t, so I need to square root both sides. And t equals the square root. Approximately, I'm going to use a little squiggly line, so approximately equal to 2.74 seconds. It's not very long, right? If he throws a piece of fruit, count for one, two, boom. The, the fruit is already hit it on the ground, almost three seconds. <clears throat> okay, that was Victor. Now, one second later, Juan also throws a piece of fruit out. Oh, we've got to keep track of what Juan has got going on. So let's change colors. Let's get some blue going on. And now Juan, the only difference between Juan is that he's not as high off the ground. He's only 72 feet up off the ground. So we'll set up the same equation. When does his land on the ground? Same gravity, same earth but now he's starting at 72 feet. If we solve this one out for one, so we've got negative 72 equals negative 16 times t squared, divide both sides by negative 16. We're solving for t. 72 divided by 16 is going to be 4.5, so t squared equals 4.5 and if I square root the 4.5 the time his fruit is going to take 2.12 seconds to smack on the ground approximately okay now based on what you've seen whose fruit is going to reach the ground first Victor or Wands you might be tempted to say, well, look, Juan took less time. This only took 2.12 seconds, whereas Victor took 2.74 seconds. But remember Juan, so we've got to be careful with word problems. Juan threw his fruit out one second later. So really, we need to add one to Juan's because of the extra second that he waited after Victor. So Juan's was at 3.12 seconds. So one, that's J, took 3.1 seconds after Victor through his, which his only took 2.74 seconds. So Victor, Victor's fruit would land first by about 0.28 seconds. Not very long, not that much faster. But go, that's an application. Things falling in the air. They use quadratic equations. We solved it by taking the square root of both sides at the right time. It's great fun, right? And we had to make sense being very careful of the problem, keeping track of each person, Victor, Juan, and all the parameters that were given in the problem. So there you go, there's week eight. We did a lot with graphs, 
standard form, a lot with finey x-intercepts, the vertex, we can do that graphically. We practice looking at factored form and intercept form of graphs. We're going to learn a new form next week, by the way. And then we did uh, some solving equations. We can use the square root of both sides. We can use factoring. Uh, and we can use graphs to help us solve all these different types of quadratic equations. All right, let me know if you have any questions as you're working through week eight material. And I look forward to seeing you guys next week.